Book the Third, The Track of a Storm, Part One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One, In Secret. The traveller fared slowly on his way, who fared towards Paris from England in the autumn of the year one thousand seven hundred and ninety-two. More than enough of bad roads, bad equipages, and bad horses he would have encountered to delay him, though the fallen and unfortunate king of France had been upon his throne in all his glory. But the changed times were fraught with other obstacles than these. Every town-gate and village taxing-house had its band of citizen patriots, with their national muskets in a most explosive state of readiness, who stopped all comers and goers, cross-questioned them, inspected their papers, looked for their names and lists of their own, turned them back, or sent them on, or stopped them and laid them in hold, as their capricious judgment or fancy deemed best, for the dawning republic, one and divisible, of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. A very few French leagues of his journey were accomplished, when Charles Darnay began to perceive that for him, along these country roads, there was no hope of return until he should have been declared a good citizen at Paris. Whatever might befall now, he must on to his journey's end. Not a mean village closed upon him, not a common barrier dropped across the road behind him, but he knew it to be another iron door in the series that was barred between him and England. The universal watchfulness so encompassed him that if he had been taken in a net, or were being forwarded to his destination in a cage, he could not have felt his freedom more completely gone. This universal watchfulness not only stopped him on the highway twenty times in a stage, but retarded his progress twenty times in a day, by riding after him and taking him back, riding before him and stopping him by anticipation, riding with him and keeping him in charge. He had been days upon his journey in France alone, when he went to bed, tired out, in a little town on the high road, still a long way from Paris. Nothing but the production of the afflicted Gabelle's letter from his prison of the Abbaye would have got him on so far. His difficulty at the guard-house in this small place had been such that he felt his journey to have come to a crisis, and he was, therefore, as little surprised as a man could be, to find himself awakened at the small inn to which he had been remitted until morning, in the middle of the night. Awakened by a timid local functionary and three armed patriots in rough red caps, and with pipes in their mouths, who sat down on the bed. Emigrant, said the functionary, I am going to send you on to Paris under an escort. Citizen, I desire nothing more than to get to Paris, though I could dispense with the escort. Silence, growled a red cap, striking at the coverlet with the butt end of his musket. Peace, aristocrat. It is as the good patriot says, observed the timid functionary. You are an aristocrat and must have an escort, and must pay for it. I have no choice, said Charles Darnay. Choice? Listen to him, cried the same scowling red cap as if it was not a favour to be protected from the lamp-iron. "'It is always as the good patriot says,' observed the functionary. "'Rise and dress yourself, emigrant.' Darnay complied, and was taken back to the guard-house, where other patriots, in rough red caps, were smoking, drinking, and sleeping by a watch-fire. Here he paid a heavy price for his escort, and hence he started with it on the wet roads at three o'clock in the morning. The escorts were two mounted patriots in red caps and tricolored cockades, armed with national muskets and sabres, who rode one on either side of him. The escort governed his own horse, but a loose line was attached to his bridle, the end of which one of the patriots kept girded around his wrist. In this state they set forth with the sharp rain driving in their faces, clattering at a heavy dragoon trot over the uneven town pavement, and out upon the mire-deep roads. In this state they traversed without change, except of horses and pace, all the mire-deep leagues that lay between them and the capital. They travelled in the night, halting an hour or two after daybreak, and lying by until the twilight fell. 
The escort were so wretchedly clothed that they twisted straw round their bare legs and thatched their ragged shoulders to keep the wet off. Apart from the personal discomfort of being so attended, and apart from such considerations of present danger as arose from one of the patriots being chronically drunk and carrying his musket very recklessly, Charles Darnay did not allow the restraint that was laid upon him to awaken any serious fears in his breast, for he reasoned with himself that it could have no reference to the merits of an individual case that was not yet stated, and of representations confirmable by the prisoner in the abaya that they were not yet made. But when they came to the town of Beauvais, which they did at eventide, when the streets were filled with people, he could not conceal from himself that the aspect of affairs was very alarming. An ominous crowd gathered to see him dismount of the posting-yard, and many voices called out loudly, "'Down with the emigrant!' He stopped in the act of swinging himself out of his saddle, and resuming it as his safest place, said, "'Emigrant, my friends, do you not see me here in France of my own will?' "'You are a cursed emigrant!' cried a farrier, making at him in a furious manner through the press, hammer in hand, "'and you are a cursed aristocrat!' The postmaster interposed himself between this man and the rider's bridle, that which he was evidently making, and soothingly said, "'Let him be. He will be judged at Paris.' "'Judged?' repeated the farrier, swinging his hammer. "'I am condemned as a traitor.' At this the crowd roared approval. Checking the postmaster, who was for turning his horse's head to the yard, the drunken patriot sat composedly in the saddle looking on, with the line round his wrist. Darnay said, as soon as he could make his voice heard, "'Friends, you deceive yourselves, or you are deceived. I am not a traitor.' "'He lies!' cried the smith. "'He is a traitor since the decree. His life is forfeit to the people. His cursed life is not his own.' At the instant when Darnay saw a rush in the eyes of the crowd, which another instant would have brought upon him, the postmaster turned his horse into the yard, the escort rode in close upon his horse's flanks, and the postmaster shot and barred the crazy double gates. The farrier struck a blow upon him with his hammer, and the crowd groaned, but no more was done. "'What is this decree that the smith spoke of?' Darnay asked the postmaster when he had thanked him and stood beside him in the yard. "'Truly a decree for selling the property of emigrants. When passed? On the fourteenth, the day I left England. Everybody says it is but one of several, and that there will be others, if there are not already, banishing all emigrants and condemning all to death who return. That is what he meant when he said your life was not your own.' "'But there are no such decrees yet.' Oh, "'What do I know?' said the postmaster, shrugging his shoulders. "'There may be, or oh, there will be, it is all the same. What would you have?' They rested on some straw in a loft until the middle of the night, and then rode forward again when all the town was asleep. Among the many wild changes observable on familiar things which made this wild ride unreal, not the least was the seeming rarity of sleep. After long and lonely spurring over dreary roads, they would come to a cluster of poor cottages, not steeped in darkness, but all glittering with lights, and would find the people in a ghostly manner in the dead of the night, circling hand in hand round a shriveled tree of liberty, or all drawn up together singing a liberty song. Happily, however, there was sleep in Beauvais that night to help them out of it, and they passed on once more into solitude and loneliness, jingling through the untimely cold and wet, among impoverished fields that had yielded no fruits of the earth that year, diversified by the blackened remains of burnt houses, by the sudden emergence of ambuscade, and sharp reining up across their way of patriot patrols on the watch on all the roads. Daylight at last found them before the wall of Paris. The barrier was closed and strongly guarded when they rode up to it. "'Where are the papers of this prisoner?' demanded a resolute-looking man in authority, who was summoned out by the guard. Naturally struck by the disagreeable word, 
Charles Darnay requested the speaker to take notice that he was a free traveller and French citizen, in charge of an escort which the disturbed state of the country had imposed upon him, and which he had paid for. Where, repeated the same personage, without taking any heed of him whatever, are the papers of this prisoner? The drunken patriot had them in his cap, and produced them. Casting his eyes over Gabelle's letter, the same personage in authority showed some disorder and surprise, and looked at Darnay with a close attention. He left escort and escorted without saying a word, however, and went into the guard-room. Meanwhile they sat upon their horses outside the gate. Looking about him while in this state of suspense, Charles Darnay observed that the gate was held by a mixed guard of soldiers and patriots, the latter far outnumbering the former, and that while ingress into the city for peasants' carts bringing in supplies, and for similar traffic and traffickers was easy enough, egress, even for the homeliest people, was very difficult. A numerous medley of men and women, not to mention beasts and vehicles of various sorts, was waiting to issue forth, but the previous identification was so strict that they filtered through the barrier very slowly. Some of these people knew their turn for examination to be so far off that they lay down on the ground to sleep or smoke, while others talked together or loitered about. The red cap and tricolour cockade were universal, both among men and women. When he had sat in his saddle some half-hour, taking note of these things, Darnay found himself confronted by the same man in authority, who directed the guard to open the barrier. Then he delivered to the escort, drunk and sober, a receipt for the escorted, and requested him to dismount. He did so, and the two patriots, leading his tired horse, turned and rode away without entering the city. He accompanied his conductor into a guard-room, smelling of common wine and tobacco, where certain soldiers and patriots, asleep and awake, drunk and sober, and in various neutral states between sleeping and waking, drunkenness and sobriety, were standing and lying about. The light in the guard-house, half derived from the waning oil-lamps of the night, and half from the overcast day, was in a correspondingly uncertain condition. Some registers were lying open on a desk, and an officer of a coarse dark aspect presided over these. "'Citizen Defarge,' said he to Darnay's conductor, as he took a slip of paper to write on, "'is this the emigrant, Evremond?' "'This is the man. Your age, Evremond?' Thirty-seven. "'Married, Evremond?' "'Yes. Where married?' "'In England.' "'Without doubt. Where is your wife, Evremond?' "'In England.' "'Without doubt. You are consigned, Evremond, to the prison of La Force.' "'Just heaven!' exclaimed Darnay. "'Under what law, and for what offence? The officer looked up from his slip of paper for a moment. "'We have new laws, Evremond, and new offences since you were here.' He said it with a hard smile, and went on writing. "'I entreat you to observe that I have come here voluntarily, in response to that written appeal of a fellow-countryman which lies before you. I demand no more than the opportunity to do so without delay. Is not that my right?' "'Emigrants have no rights, Evremond,' was the stolid reply. The officer wrote until he had finished, read over to himself what he had written, sanded it, and handed it to Defarge, with the words, "'In secret.' Defarge motioned with the paper to the prisoner that he must accompany him. The prisoner obeyed, and a guard of two armed patriots attended them. "'Is it you?' said Defarge, in a low voice, as they went down the guard-house steps and turned into Paris, "'who married the daughter of Dr. Manette.' once a prisoner in the Bastille that is no more?' "'Yes,' replied Darnay, looking at him with surprise. "'My name is Defarge, and I keep a wine-shop in the quarter Saint Antoine. Possibly you have heard of me. My wife came to your house to reclaim her father? Yes.' The word wife seemed to serve as a gloomy reminder to Defarge, to say with sudden impatience, 
in the name of that sharp female newly born and called La Guillotine, why did you come to France? You heard me say why a minute ago. Do you not believe it is the truth? A bad truth for you, said Defarge, speaking with knitted brows and looking straight before him. Indeed, I am lost here. All here is so unprecedented, so changed, so sudden and unfair, that I am absolutely lost. Will you render me a little help? None, Defarge spoke, always looking straight before him. Will you answer me a single question? Perhaps, according to its nature, you can say what it is. In this prison that I am going to so unjustly, shall I have some free communication with the world outside? You will see. I am not to be buried there, prejudged, and without any means of presenting my case. You will see. But what then? Other people have been similarly buried in worse prisons before now. But never by me, Citizen Defarge. Defarge glanced darkly at him for answer, and walked on in a steady and set silence. The deeper he sank into his silence, the fainter hope there was, or so Darnay thought, of his softening in any slight degree. He, therefore, made haste to say, It is of the utmost importance to me, you know, citizen, even better than I, of how much importance, that I should be able to communicate to Mr. Lorry of Tellson's Bank, an English gentleman who is now in Paris, the simple fact, without comment, that I have been thrown into the prison of La Force. Will you cause that to be done for me? I will do, Defarge doggedly rejoined, nothing for you. My duty is to my country and to the people. I am the sworn servant of both, against you. I will do nothing for you. Charles Darnay felt it hopeless to entreat him any further, and his pride was touched besides. As they walked on in silence, he could not but see how used the people were to the spectacle of prisoners passing along the streets. The very children scarcely noticed him. A few passers turned their heads, and a few shook their fingers at him as an aristocrat. Otherwise, that a man in good clothes should be going to prison was no more remarkable than that a labourer in working clothes should be going to work. In one narrow, dark, and dirty street through which they passed, an excited orator, mounted on a stool, was addressing an excited audience on the crimes against the people of the king and the royal family. The few words that he caught from this man's lips first made it known to Charles Darnay that the king was in prison, and that the foreign ambassadors had one and all left Paris. On the road, except at Beauvais, he had heard absolutely nothing. The escort and the universal watchfulness had completely isolated him. That he had fallen among far greater dangers than those which had developed themselves when he left England, he of course knew now. That perils had thickened about him fast, and might thicken faster and faster yet, he of course knew now. He could not but admit to himself that he might not have made this journey if he could have foreseen the events of a few days. And yet his misgivings were not so dark as, imagined by the light of this later time, they would appear. Troubled as the future was, it was the unknown future, and in its obscurity there was ignorant hope. The horrible massacre, days and nights long, which, within a few rounds of the clock, was to set a great mark of blood upon the blessed garnering time of harvest, was as far out of his knowledge as if it had been a hundred thousand years away. The sharp female newly born and called La Guillotine was hardly known to him, or to the generality of people by name. The frightful deeds that were to be soon done were probably unimagined at that time in the brains of the doers. How could they have a place in the shadowy conceptions of a gentle mind? Of unjust treatment in detention and hardship, and in cruel separation from his wife and child, he foreshadowed the likelihood or the certainty but beyond this he dreaded nothing distinctly. With this on his mind, which was enough to carry into a dreary prison courtyard, he arrived at the prison of La Force. 
A man with a bloated face opened the strong wicket, to whom Defarge presented the emigrant Evremonde. "'What the devil! How many more of them!' exclaimed the man with the bloated face. Defarge took his receipt without noticing the exclamation, and withdrew, with his two fellow-patriots. "'What the devil, I say again!' exclaimed the jailer, left with his wife. "'How many more!' The jailer's wife, being provided with no answer to the question, merely replied, "'One must have patience, my dear.' Three turnkeys who entered responsive to a bell she rang echoed the sentiment, and one added, "'For the love of liberty,' which sounded in that place like an inappropriate conclusion. The prison of La Force was a gloomy prison, dark and filthy, and with a horrible smell of foul sleep in it extraordinary how soon the noisome flavour of imprisoned sleep becomes manifest in all such places that are ill cared for in secret too grumbled the jailer looking at the written paper as if i was not already full to bursting he stuck the paper on a file in an ill humour and charles darnay awaited his further pleasure for half an hour sometimes pacing to and fro in the strong arched room sometimes resting on a stone seat, in either case detained to be imprinted on the memory of the chief and his subordinates. "'Come,' said the chief, at length taking up his keys, "'come with me, emigrant.' Through the dismal twilight his new charge accompanied him by corridor and staircase, many doors clanging and locking behind them, until they came into a large, low, vaulted chamber, crowded with prisoners of both sexes, the women were seated at a long table, reading and writing, knitting, sewing, and embroidering. The men were, for the most part, standing behind their chairs, or lingering up and down the room. In the instinctive association of prisoners with shameful crime and disgrace, the newcomer recoiled from this company. But the crowning unreality of his long unreal ride was, there all at once rising to receive him, with every refinement of manner known to the time and with all the engaging graces and courtesies of life. So strangely clouded were these refinements by the prison manners and gloom, so spectral did they become in the inappropriate squalor and misery through which they were seen, that Charles Darnay seemed to stand in a company of the dead. Ghosts all, the ghost of beauty, the ghost of stateliness, the ghost of elegance, the ghost of pride, the ghost of frivolity, the ghost of wit, the ghost of youth, the ghost of age, all waiting their dismissal from the desolate shore, all turning on him eyes that were changed by the death they had died in coming there. It struck him motionless. The jailer standing at his side, and the other jailers moving about, who would have been well enough as to appearance in the ordinary exercise of their functions, looked so extraordinarily coarse, contrasted with sorrowing mothers and blooming daughters who were there, with the apparitions of the coquette, the young beauty, and the mature woman delicately bred, that the inversion of all experience and likelihood which the scene of shadows presented was heightened to its utmost. Surely, ghosts all, surely, the long unreal ride, some progress of disease, that had brought him to these gloomy shades. In the name of the assembled companions in misfortune, said a gentleman of courtly appearance and address, coming forward, "'I have the honour of giving you welcome to La Force, and of condoling with you on the calamity that has brought you among us. May it soon terminate happily. There would be an impertinence elsewhere, but it is not so here to ask your name and condition.' Charles Darnay roused himself, and gave the required information in words as suitable as he could find. "'But I hope,' said the gentleman, following the chief jailer with his eyes, who moved across the room, "'that you are not in secret. I do not understand the meaning of the term, but I have heard them say so. Ah, what a pity! We so much regret it. But take courage. Several members of our society have been in secret at first, and it has lasted but a short time. Then, he added, raising his voice, I grieve to inform the society in secret. 
There was a murmur of commiseration as Charles Darnay crossed the room to a grated door where the jailer awaited him, and many voices, among which the soft and compassionate voices of women were conspicuous, gave him good wishes and encouragement. He turned at the grated door to render the thanks of his heart. It closed upon the jailer's hand, and the apparitions vanished from his sight forever. The wicket opened on a stone staircase leading upward. When they had ascended forty steps, the prisoner of half an hour already counted them, the jailer opened a low black door, and they passed into a solitary cell. It struck cold and damp, but was not dark. "'Yours,' said the jailer. "'Why am I confined alone? How do I know? I can buy pen, ink, and paper. Such are not my orders. You will be visited, and can ask then. At present you may buy your food, and nothing more.' There were in the cell a chair, a table, and a straw mattress. As the jailer made a general inspection of these objects, and of the four walls, before going out, a wandering fancy wandered through the mind of the prisoner leaning against the wall opposite to him, that this jailer was so unwholesomely bloated, both in face and person, as to look like a man who had been drowned and filled with water. When the jailer was gone, he thought in the same wandering way, now am I left, as if I were dead. Stopping then to look down at the mattress, he turned from it with a sick feeling, and thought, And here, in these crawling creatures, is the first condition of the body after death. Five paces by four and a half, five paces by four and a half, five paces by four and a half. The prisoner walked to and fro in his cell, counting its measurement, and the roar of the city arose like muffled drums, with a wild swell of voices added to them. He made shoes, he made shoes, he made shoes. Five? Five paces by four and a half. With such scraps tossing and rolling upward from the depths of his mind, the prisoner walked faster and faster, obstinately counting and counting, and the roar of the city changed to this extent that it still rolled in like muffled drums, but with the wail of voices that he knew in the swell that rose above them. CHAPTER Two, THE GRINDSTONE Telson's bank, established in the Saint-Germain quarter of Paris, was in a wing of a large house, approached by a courtyard and shut off from the street by a high wall and a strong gate. The house belonged to a great nobleman who had lived in it until he made a flight from the troubles in his own cook's dress and got across the borders. A mere beast of the chase flying from hunters, he was still in the metempsychosis no other than the same Monseigneur, the preparation of whose chocolate for whose lips had once occupied three strong men besides the cook in question. Monseigneur gone, and the three strong men absolving themselves from the sin of having drawn his high wages, by being more than ready and willing to cut his throat on the altar of the dawning republic, one and indivisible of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. Monseigneur's house had been first sequestrated, and then confiscated. For all things moved so fast, and decree followed decree with that fierce precipitation, but now, upon the third night of the autumn month of September, patriot emissaries of the law were in possession of Monseigneur's house, and had marked it with the tricolour, and were drinking brandy in its state apartments. A place of business in London, like Towson's place of business in Paris, would soon have driven the house out of its mind and into the Gazette. For what would staid British responsibility and respectability have said to orange trees in boxes in a bank courtyard, and even to a cupid over the counter. Yet such things were. Telson's had whitewashed the cupid, but he was still to be seen on the ceiling, in the coolest linen, aiming, as he very often does, at money from morning to night. Bankruptcy must inevitably have come of this young pagan in Lombard Street, London, and also of a curtained alcove in the rear of the immortal boy, and also of a looking-glass let into the wall, and also of clerks not at all old, who danced in public on the slightest provocation. Yet a French Telson's could get on with these things exceedingly well, 
and as long as the times held together, no man had taken fright at them and drawn out his money. What money would be drawn out of Telson's henceforth, and what would lie there, lost and forgotten? What plate and jewels would tarnish in Telson's hiding places, while the depositors rusted in prisons, and when they should have violently perished? How many accounts with Telson's never to be balanced in this world must be carried over into the next? No man could have said that night any more than Mr. Jarvis Lorry could, though he thought heavily of these questions. He sat by a newly lighted wood fire, the blighted and unfruitful year was prematurely cold, and on his honest and courageous face there was a deeper shade than the pendant lamp could throw, or any object in the room distortedly reflect, a shade of horror. He occupied rooms in the bank, in his fidelity to the house of which he had grown to be a part, like a strong root ivy. It chanced that they derived a kind of security from the patriotic occupation of the main building, but the true-hearted old gentleman never calculated upon that. All such circumstances were indifferent to him, so that he did his duty. On the opposite side of the courtyard, under a colonnade, was extensive standing for carriages, where, indeed, some carriages of Monseigneur yet stood. Against two of the pillars were fastened two great flaring flambeaux, and in the light of these, standing out in the open air, was a large grindstone, a roughly mounted thing which appeared to have hurriedly been brought there from some neighboring smithy or other workshop. Rising and looking out of window at these harmless objects, Mr. Lorry shivered and retired to his seat by the fire. He had opened not only the glass window, but the lattice blind outside it, and he had closed both again, and he shivered through his frame. From the streets beyond the high wall and the strong gates there came the usual night hum of the city, with now and then an indescribable ring in it, weird and unearthly, as if some unwanted sounds of a terrible nature were going up to heaven. "'Thank God!' said Mr. Lorry, clasping his hands, "'that no one near and dear to me is in this dreadful town to-night. May he have mercy on all who are in danger.' Soon afterwards the bell at the great gate sounded, and he thought, "'They have come back,' and sat listening. But there was no loud eruption into the courtyard as he had expected, and he heard the gate clash again, and all was quiet. The nervousness and dread that were upon him inspired that vague uneasiness respecting the bank which a great change would naturally awaken with such feelings roused. It was well guarded, and he got up to go among the trusty people who were guarding it, when his door suddenly opened and two figures rushed in, at sight of which he fell back in amazement. Lucy and her father. Lucy with her arms stretched out to him, and with that old look of earnestness so concentrated and intensified, that it seemed as though it had been stamped upon her face expressly to give force and power to it in this one passage of her life. "'What is this?' cried Mr. Lorry, breathless and confused. "'What is the matter? Lucy? Manette? What has happened? What has brought you here? What is it?' With the look fixed upon him, in her paleness and wildness, she panted out in his arms, imploringly, "'Oh, my dear friend! My husband!' "'Your husband, Lucy? Charles! Oh, what of Charles? Here!' here, in Paris, has been here some days, three or four, I don't know how many, I can't collect my thoughts. An errand of generosity brought him here unknown to us. He was stopped at the barrier and sent to prison. The old man uttered an irrepressible cry. Almost at the same moment the beg of the great gate rang again, and a loud noise of feet and voices came pouring into the courtyard. "'What is that noise?' said the doctor, turning towards the window. "'Don't look!' cried Mr. Lorry. "'Don't look out! Manette, for your life, don't touch the blind!' The doctor turned, with his hand upon the fastening of the window, and said, with a cool, bold smile, "'My dear friend, I have a charmed life in this city. I have been a Bastille prisoner. There is no patriot in Paris.' In Paris, 
in France, who, knowing me to have been a prisoner in the Bastille, would touch me, except to overwhelm me with embraces or carry me in triumph. My old pain has given me a power that has brought us through the barrier and gained us news of Charles there, and brought us here. I knew it would be so. I knew I could help Charles out of all danger. I told Lucy so. What is that noise? His hand was again upon the window. Don't look, cried Mr. Lorry, absolutely desperate. No, Lucy, my dear, nor you. He got his arm round her and held her. Don't be so terrified, my love. I solemnly swear to you that I know of no harm having happened to Charles, that I had no suspicion even of his being in this fatal place. What prison is he in? La Force. La Force. Lucy, my child, if ever you were brave and serviceable in your life, and you were always both, you will compose yourself now to do exactly as I bid you, for more depends upon it than you can think or I can say. There is no help for you in any action on your part tonight. You cannot possibly stir out. I say this because what I must bid you to do for Charles's sake is the hardest thing to do of all. You must instantly be obedient, still, and quiet. You must let me put you in a room at the back here. You must leave your father and me alone for two minutes, and as there are life and death in the world, you must not delay. I will be submissive to you. I see in your face that you know I can do nothing else than this. I know you are true. The old man kissed her and hurried her into his room, turned the key. Then came hurrying back to the doctor and opened the window and partly opened the blind and put his hand upon the doctor's arm and looked out with him into the courtyard. Looked out upon a throng of men and women, not enough in number or near enough to fill the courtyard, not more than forty or fifty in all. The people in possession of the house had let them in at the gate, and they had rushed in to work at the grindstone. It had evidently been set up there for their purpose, as in a convenient and retired spot. But such awful workers, and such awful work! The grindstone had a double handle, and turning at it madly were two men, whose faces, as their long hair flapped back when the whirlings of the grindstone brought their faces up, were more horrible and cruel than the visages of the wildest savages in their most barbarous disguise. False eyebrows and false moustaches were stuck upon them, and their hideous countenances were all bloody and sweaty, and all awry with howling, and all staring and glaring with beastly excitement and want of sleep. As these ruffians turned and turned, their matted locks now flung forward over their eyes, now flung backward over their necks, some women held wine to their mouths that they might drink, and what with dropping blood, and what with dropping wine, and what with the stream of sparks struck out of the stone, all their wicked atmosphere seemed gore and fire. The eye cannot detect one creature in the group free from the smear of blood. Shouldering one another to get next at the sharpening stone were men stripped at the waist, with the stain all over their limbs and bodies, men in all sorts of rags, with a stain upon those rags, men devilishly set off with spoils of women's lace and silk and ribbon, with a stain dyeing those trifles through and through. Hatchets, knives, bayonets, swords, all brought to be sharpened, were all red with it. Some of the hacked swords were tied to the wrists of those who carried them with strips of linen and fragments of dress, ligatures various in kind, but all deep of the one color and as the frantic wielders of these weapons snatched them from the stream of sparks and tore away into the streets, the same red hue was red in their frenzied eyes, eyes which any unbrutalized beholder would have given twenty years of life to petrify with a well-directed gun. All this was seen in a moment as the vision of a drowning man or of any human creature at any very great pass could see a world if it were there. They drew back from the window, and the doctor looked for explanation in his friend's ashy face. "'They are,' 
Mr. Lorry whispered the words, glancing fearfully round at the locked room, murdering the prisoners. If you are sure of what you say, if you really have the power you think you have, as I believe you have, make yourself known to these devils and get taken to La Force. It may be too late, I don't know, but let it not be a minute later. Dr. Manette pressed his hand, hastened bareheaded out of the room, and was in the courtyard when Mr. Lorry regained the blind. His streaming white hair, his remarkable face, and the impetuous confidence of his manner, as he put the weapons aside like water, carried him in an instant to the heart of the concourse at the stone. For a few moments there was a pause, and a hurry, and a murmur, and the unintelligible sound of his voice. And then Mr. Lorry saw him, surrounded by all, and in the midst of a line of twenty men long, all linked shoulder to shoulder and hand to shoulder, hurried out with cries of, Live the Bastille prisoner! Help for the Bastille prisoners kindred in La Force! Room for a Bastille prisoner in front there! Save the prisoner Evremont à La Force! And a thousand answering shots. He closed the lattice again with a fluttering heart, closed the window and the curtain, hastened to Lucy, and told her that her father was assisted by the people and gone in search of her husband. He found her child and Miss Pross with her, but it never occurred to him to be surprised by their appearance until a long time afterwards, when he sat watching them in such quiet as the night knew. Lucy had by that time fallen into a stupor on the floor at his feet, clinging to his hand. Miss Pross had laid the child down on his own bed, and her head had gradually fallen on the pillow beside her pretty charge. Oh, the long, long night, with the moans of the poor wife! And oh, the long, long night, with no return of her father, and no tidings! Twice more in the darkness the bell at the great gate sounded, and the eruption was repeated, and the grindstone whirled and spluttered. "'What is it?' cried Lucy, affrighted. "'Hush! The soldiers' swords are sharpened there,' said Mr. Lorry. "'The place is national property now, and used as a kind of armory, my love.' Twice more in all. But the last spell of work was feeble and fitful. Soon afterwards the day began to dawn, and he softly detached himself from the clasping hand, and cautiously looked out again. A man, so besmeared, that he might have been a sorely wounded soldier creeping back to consciousness on a field of slain, was rising from the pavement by the side of the grindstone, and looking about him with a vacant air. Shortly this worn-out murderer descried in the imperfect light one of the carriages of Monseigneur, and staggering to that gorgeous vehicle, climbed in at the door, and shut himself up to take his rest on its dainty cushions. The great grindstone earth had turned when Mr. Lorry looked out again, and the sun was red on the courtyard. But the lesser grindstone stood alone there in the calm morning air, with a red upon it that the sun had never given, and would never take away. CHAPTER Three, THE SHADOW one of the first considerations which arose in the business mind of Mr. Lorry when business hours came round was this, that he had no right to imperil Telson's by sheltering the wife of an emigrant prisoner under the bank roof. His own possessions, safety, life, he would have hazarded for Lucy and her child without a moment's demur. But the great trust he held was not his own, and as to that business charge, he was a strict man of business. At first his mind reverted to Defarge, and the thought of finding out the wine-shop again and taking counsel with its master in reference to the safest dwelling-place in the distracted state of the city. But the same consideration that suggested him repudiated him. He lived in the most violent quarter, and doubtless was influential there, and deep in its dangerous workings. Noon coming, and the doctor not returning, and every minute's delay tending to compromise Telson's, Mr. Lorry advised with Lucy. She said that her father had spoken of hiring a lodging for a short term in that quarter near the banking-house. As there was no business objection to this, and as he foresaw that even it were all well with Charles, and he were to be released, he could not hope to leave the city, Mr. Lorry went out in quest of such a lodging, and found a suitable one, high up in a removed by-street, 
where the closed blinds of all the other windows of a high melancholy square of buildings marked deserted homes. To this lodging he at once removed Lucy and her child and Miss Pross, giving them what comfort he could, and much more than he had himself. He left Jerry with them as a figure to fill a doorway that would bear considerable knocking on the head, and returned to his own occupations. A disturbed and doleful mind he brought to bear upon them, and slowly and heavily the day lagged on with him. It wore itself out, and wore him out with it, until the bank closed. He was again alone in his room of the previous night, considering what to do next, when he heard a foot upon the stair. In a few moments a man stood in his presence, who, with a keenly observant look at him, addressed him by his name. "'Your servant, Mr. Lorry. Do you know me?' He was a strongly made man with dark curling hair, from forty-five to fifty years of age. For answer he repeated, without any change of emphasis, the words, "'Do you know me? I have seen you somewhere. Perhaps at my wine-shop.' Much interested and agitated, Mr. Lorry said, "'You come from Dr. Manette?' "'Yes, I come from Dr. Manette. And what says he? What does he send me?' Defarge gave into his anxious hand an open scrap of paper. He bore the words in the doctor's writing, "'Charles is safe, but I cannot safely leave this place yet. I have obtained the favour that the bearer has a short note from Charles to his wife. Let the bearer see his wife.' It was dated from La Force within an hour. "'Will you accompany me?' said Mr. Lorry, joyfully relieved after reading this note aloud. To where his wife resides? Yes, returned Defarge. Scarcely noticing as yet in what a curiously reserved and mechanical way Defarge spoke, Mr. Lorry put on his hat, and they went down into the courtyard. There they found two women, one knitting. Madame Defarge, surely, said Mr. Lorry, who had left her in exactly the same attitude some seventeen years ago. It is she, observed her husband. "'Does madame go with us?' inquired Mr. Lorry, seeing that she moved as they moved. "'Yes, that she may be able to recognize the faces and know the persons. It is for their safety.' Beginning to be struck by Defarge's manner, Mr. Lorry looked dubiously at him, and led the way. Both the women followed, the second woman being the vengeance. They passed through the intervening streets as quickly as they might, ascended the staircase of the new domicile, were admitted by Jerry, and found Lucy weeping, alone. She was thrown into a transport by the tidings Mr. Lorry gave her of her husband, and clasped the hand that delivered his note, little thinking what it had been doing near him in the night, and might, but for a chance, have done to him. "'Dearest, take courage. I am well, and your father has influence around me. You cannot answer this. Kiss our child for me. That was all the writing. It was so much, however, to her who received it, that she turned from Defarge to his wife, and kissed one of the hands that knitted. It was a passionate, loving, thankful, womanly action. But the hand made no response, dropped cold and heavy, and took to its knitting again. There was something in its touch that gave Lucy a check. She stopped in the act of putting the note in her bosom, and, with her hands yet at her neck, looked terrified at Madame Defarge. Madame Defarge met the lifted eyebrows and forehead with a cold, impassive stare. "'My dear,' said Mr. Lorry, striking in to explain, "'there are frequent risings in the streets, and, although it is not likely they will ever trouble you, Madame Defarge wishes to see those whom she has the power to protect at such times, to the end that she may know them, that she may identify them, I believe. I believe, said Mr. Lorry, rather halting in his reassuring words, as the stony manner of all the three impressed itself upon him more and more, I state the case, Citizen Defarge. Defarge looked gloomily at his wife, and gave no other answer than a gruff sound of acquiescence. "'You had better, Lucy,' said Mr. Lorry, doing all he could to propitiate by tone and manner, 
are the dear child here, and our good Pross. Our good Pross, Defarge, is an English lady, and knows no French. The lady in question, whose rooted conviction that she was more than a match for any foreigner, was not to be shaken by distress and danger, appeared with folded arms, and observed in English, to the vengeance, whom her eyes first encountered, "'Well, I am sure, bold face, I hope you are pretty well.' She also bestowed a British cough on Madame Defarge, but neither of the two took much heed of her. "'Is that his child?' said Madame Defarge, stopping in her work for the first time, and pointing her knitting-needle at little Lucy, as if it were the finger of fate. "'Yes, madame,' answered Mr. Lorry, "'that is our poor prisoner's darling daughter and only child.' The shadow attendant on Madame Defarge and her party seemed to fall so threatening and dark on the child that her mother instinctively kneeled on the ground beside her and held her to her breast. The shadow attendant on Madame Defarge and her party seemed then to fall, threatening and dark, on both the mother and the child. "'It is enough, my husband,' said Madame Defarge. "'I have seen them. We may go.' But the suppressed manner had enough menace in it, not visible and presented, but indistinct and withheld, to alarm Lucy into saying, as she laid her appealing hand on Madame Defarge's dress, you will be good to my poor husband. You will do him no harm. You will help me to see him, if you can. Your husband is not my business here, returned Madame Defarge, looking down at her with perfect composure. It is the daughter of your father who is my business here. For my sake, then, be merciful to my husband. For my child's sake, she will put her hands together and pray you to be merciful. We are more afraid of you than of these others. Madame Defarge received it as a compliment, and looked at her husband. Defarge, who had been uneasily biting his thumbnail and looking at her, collected his face into a sterner expression. "'What is it that your husband says in that little letter?' asked Madame Defarge, with a lowering smile. "'Influence? He says something touching influence. "'That my father—' said Lucy, hurriedly taking the paper from her breast, but with her alarmed eyes on her questioner and not on it, has much influence around him. "'Surely it will release him,' said Madame Defarge. "'Let it do so.' "'As a wife and mother,' cried Lucy, most earnestly, "'I implore you to have pity on me, and not to exercise any power that you possess against my innocent husband, but to use it in his behalf.' "'Oh, sister-woman, think of me as a wife and mother!' Madame Defarge looked coldly as ever at the suppliant, and said, turning to her friend the vengeance, "'The wives and mothers we have been used to see, since we were as little as this child, and much less, have not been greatly considered. We have known their husbands and fathers laid in prison and kept from them often enough.' All our lives we have seen our sister-women suffer in themselves and in their children, poverty, nakedness, hunger, thirst, sickness, misery, oppression, and neglect of all kinds. We have seen nothing else, returned the vengeance. We have borne this a long time, said Madame Defarge, turning her eyes again upon Lucy. Judge you! Is it likely that the trouble of one wife and mother would be much to us now? She resumed her knitting and went out. The vengeance followed. Defarge went last and closed the door. Courage, my dear Lucy, said Mr. Lorry, as he raised her. Courage! So far all goes well with us, much, much better than it has of late gone with many poor souls. Cheer up, and have a thankful heart. I am not thankless, I hope, but that dreadful woman seems to throw a shadow on me and all my hopes. Tut, tut, said Mr. Lorry, what is this despondency in the brave little breast? A shadow, indeed, no substance in it, Lucy. But the shadow of the manner of these defarges was dark upon himself, for all that. 
and in his secret mind it troubled him greatly. End of part one.